Hello everyone and welcome to the Adaptation Design Tool Mentored Online Course Orientation. My name is Sherry Wagner and I'm the Reef Resilience Program Coordinator at the Nature Conservancy and the coordinator for this month-long training. Today I'm going to give you a brief orientation and overview of the course and then we'll hear from our mentors Jordan West who will give an introduction to the content of the course and Eric Conklin and Tova Callender, two marine practitioners working in Hawaii who will describe their experiences using the tool. The, the development of this course has been a truly collaborative project of the Climate Change Working Group of the Interagency U.S. Coral Reef Task Force and the Nature Conservancy. And this orientation is being recorded today, so you can view it later on if you want to go back and see anything we've talked about. And I'll also send out the link once it's posted. So to get us started today, we just wanted to find out who was on the phone give us a better idea of who's joined us today. So I have a few poll questions for you. I'll go ahead and launch the first poll. So the question is, what's the focus region of your work? Do you work in Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Indian, across multiple ocean basins or globally or other? So I'll just give you a minute to respond and then we'll show the answers. Okay, so it looks like a lot of Pacific uh, Ocean folks, and it might just be the time of the call today, um, that uh, that's the case. And the next question is, what sector do you work in? Do you work at a government agency at one of these levels? Do you work as a, for an NGO or other, private, something like that? you a student. <laughs> okay, so let me share the results with you. Oh, looks like a lot of federal national government employees and um, some NGOs and other. Okay, thanks. And we have one more question for you. Uh, what system are you interested in using adaptation planning for? Coral reefs, wetlands, watersheds, many of these or other. Again, I like to always give you another. None of these fit. Okay, so looks like uh, coral reefs and multiple. So that makes a lot of sense. So that gives us a better idea. Thanks for taking the polls. Gives us a better idea of who's on the call today. So um, I also just we had someone, um, David Gibbs, who's on the call, make this map for us of the people that registered today for the webinar. You guys are um, across the world, US, Caribbean, um, South America, Central America, Africa, Middle East, India, Madagascar, Indonesia, I just picked out some of the places, American Samoa, Fiji, um, 32 countries as of now. So these will be people um, that will probably be in the course with you that you can um, know that are taking the course at the same time as you, which is great. So welcome everyone. Um, so here's the outline for today's webinar. First, I'll give background on the Reef Resilience Network. Um, then I'll go over the course schedule and activities. I'll walk you through how to sign up for the course and then take a few questions if you have them about what I've covered so far. Then we'll switch over to Jordan West, who'll give an introduction to the tool and content of the course. And finally, Eric and Tova will describe their experiences using the tool, and we'll have a final Q&A session with all the presenters. And so on this GoToWebinar, there's two ways you can ask questions. Um, you can type into the question box at any time your question, um, or during the question period, if you raise your hand, which you do by clicking on the small hand icon on the toolbar, and you're able, you have audio, then we can actually call on you. So we might try that too, um, we'll see. And so if you're having any difficulties such as trouble hearing or seeing slides, send me a message by the question box, that same box, and I'll try to help you resolve the issue. So let's get started. Some of you may be familiar with the Reef Resilience Network, but I'll tell you a bit about what we do and the resources that we have for managers. 
The network's a partnership effort to build the capacity of coral reef managers and practitioners around the world to better address the impacts of climate change and other stressors. And we do this, we build capacity through providing access to new coral reef science and management strategies, virtual capacity building activities such as this online course and webinars. And we'd also do in-person trainings and learning exchanges to build manager skills. And we've been conducting in-person training since 2005 and have reached managers from 75% of the countries and territories with reefs in person in person and in, with online trainings like this one. So our toolkit, the Reef Resilience Toolkit, reefresilience.org is an online hub. It has a number of modules can, uh, covering science and management strategies for resilient coral reefs and reef fisheries, effective communication strategies, and community-based adaptation. And we're in the process of developing a new reef restoration module uh, with partners as well, which I think we're going to launch by the end of this month. And we all also have over 40 case studies highlighting lessons learned and best practice practices managing coral reef ecosystems and supporting resilient communities. And you can also view past webinar recordings uh, find other online courses and our network forum where you can connect, share, and learn from others about how to better manage marine resources. So now we'll take a deep dive into the course schedule. Um, this is an overview of the course, which runs from for one month from today until November 17th. There are four self-paced lessons, three webinars, and learning exercises throughout. And the time commitment we estimated for the course is about eight to 10 hours over the month. After this orientation webinar that you're on today, you can enroll in the course and begin the lessons. Lessons one and two and the reading assignment will help introduce you to Climate Smart Planning and the Adaptation Design Tool and will take approximately one and a half hours to complete. During this time, you'll be able to interact with course mentors by posting questions and comments on our online discussion board. Then you'll move on to the next section of the course, which focuses on climate smart design for existing management actions. Lesson three in the assignment will take you about two and a half hours to complete. You also have the opportunity to post questions and comments for our mentors on the discussion board. Then a second webinar will be held to go into more depth on the content and assignment that you completed in that section. And then moving on to the final section of the course on expanding your list of management actions and using the tool results to inform other steps of the Climate Smart conservation cycle. This section also includes an online lesson assignment and Q&A. And then there's a concluding webinar in which they'll take you about this whole time will take you about one and a half hours to complete. And then magically a pot of gold appears when you get to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> I hope that's how you feel um, once you take the course, like you've got really gotten something out of it. So just briefly, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about the um, online lessons. There's four. Um, the first one is features key concepts of climate smart conservation. Uh, the next lesson goes into best practices for using the adaptation design tool effectively. Um, next lesson three is how to apply climate smart design considerations to your management actions. And the last lesson is how to expand your list of adaptation op options by identifying gaps in your management actions. So that's just a brief uh, intro to the course, and Jordan uh, West is going to be going into a little more depth after my presentation. So I wanted you to meet the team of people. There's actually, of course, more people that were helped develop the course, but these are the folks that are most involved uh, with you as you journey through taking this course, course with us. And you'll have a chance to interact with these mentors and staff. Um, all of our mentors include experts in coral reef conservation and management, reef resilience, coastal adaptation, uh, wetland ecology, ridge to reef management, and community climate adaptation. And they have decades of field experience uh, among them that cover reef regions around the world. 
These experts will be available to answer your questions on the network forum and on our webinars, and their role is to enhance the lessons by sharing their knowledge and experiences with you. And they'll be a resource for any questions you might have on the course content. And they're all terrific and very excited to get to work with you. And I just wanted to make a special uh, introduction to Jillian Silvertand up here, Jill. She's not on the webinar today, but she's our technic technical expert and can help on any technical issues you have with the online lessons. And you'll see her email on the course page for contacting her if you have any problems. So now um, let's take a look at the online course online. So this is our home page. The course is hosted on Conservation Training, which is an open and free learning community that offers conservation-based training materials from the Nature Conservancy and our partner organizations. And this uh, course, this is our direct course page, which contains all the information that you'll need to take the course, links to the lessons and assignments and webinars and dates for um, completing all the sections. So I wanted to show you, I'm scrolling down. When you first come into the course, it will probably be, everything will probably be closed like this. So all the sections of the course are down here and you can either click over here to open them all and see them, or you can just open one section at a time. So I'll just show you, I just click this and on, under getting started, there's information about um, and technical requirements for the course and how to take an online course just going to click on there to show you there's a lot in here about navigating through the course room and so if you have some problems with that part of it you want to check in here first and see if there's something uh, you can learn and if not you can always um, get in touch with us and we can help you um, to navigate back from uh, back to the home page you're going to go up here to these breadcrumbs as we call them you're just going to click there and it's going to take you right back so then I'll just scroll down. So here's the getting started section again. Here, if you click on mentor bios, this is information about all the mentors in the course. And you can just click through the list here to read their bios and find out more about what they do. Um, so this is the first section of the course here. I'll just show you we're doing the orientation webinar right now. And we'll put the recording right here. There'll be a link if you want to um, listen to it again or find some part of it. And then as you see, the next sections of the course are here. So I just wanted to show you, this is the first section after the webinar. And here's where you get to the self-paced lessons. So you just click to open a lesson and click enter. And then you'll see the lesson will open in the same window. And you can always uh, leave uh, the lesson anytime and come back. And it'll ask you if you wanna uh, go resume to where you were. So that will launch the lesson there. And I'm just gonna point out the navigation is long here, down at the bottom of the page, almost like a tab on a web page. And then the same thing to go back, I just need to find exit activity, or again, I can click up here on the breadcrumbs. So the when you finish a lesson, a check mark will appear next to it, like these down here in this little box. And you'll need to complete all the lessons and the course survey in order to download your course certificate of completion. So anyone can get one of those if you've gone through all of the lessons. So I'm just going to go back to my presentation and go through a few more things. Now you um, will have to create a course account to be able to get into the course page that I just showed you. So basically you want to go to conservationtraining.org where I just was and you'll click up here to sign up, fill out the um, form here and click, click create my new uh, account. And then you'll get a confirmation email from conservation training admin desk and apparently might go to your spam folder according to them. So please check that as well. And then you can confirm your account by clicking the link in the email. And then one more step is you need to enroll in the course. So that just sets up your account to use in conservation training. What you'll need to do then is you can go back and find our adaptation 
design tool online course. This is the link. I'll be sending this out by email so you don't have to worry about writing it down right now. Um, but you'll want to log in and there's this enrollment key that you put in to enroll and then you click enroll me. And finally, I'm not going to, this is my final uh, instruction slide and I'm not going to go through how to do this, but I wanted to show you that the course mentors will be um, taking questions on our on, uh, online discussion forum, the network forum. And basically once you, uh, once you get an account, you can click here on groups and you'll see our, our group here is Adaptation Design Tool Online Course and you'll wanna click here to join the group. And then in, once you're inside there, you'll see uh, the topic about sending your questions that you can reply to. Okay, so um, this is the end of the orientation portion of the webinar. And um, I'm open to take some, a few questions right now if you have them, and then we'll move on um, to the rest of the presentations. So again, you can um, type your question into the question box, um, or you can raise your hand and I can call on you. I'm just gonna check and see if we have any questions here so far. Well, also we can do questions, we'll be taking questions at the end, so we can do them then too. Okay, it looks like we've got a few here. So can you say a bit about how much is reef specific versus more general? I think we'll go into that a little bit in Jordan's presentation, so let's um, wait for that part, of, we'll wait for that question. Um, and then the other question is a course free of charge. Yes, the course is free, all the webinars are free, the, the, um, the whole course is free. So thank you for your questions. And um, now I will turn it over to Jordan West. He'll go into more depth about the content of the course and introduce some concepts to you. So Jordan, I'm switching it over right now to you, and we should be getting your screen in a minute. Great, I can see it, thanks. How does it look? Great, all you. Excellent. Well, I wanna start on, on behalf of my uh, co-lead, Britt Parker, and myself, as well as our larger project team to Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for your interest, um, allowing us to share this tool, but more importantly, we'll be learning so much um, as you, in a sense, join the team and help us continue to test it and refine the ideas. We're really excited to be here. And for those of you on the phone, thank you. For those of you not on the phone who might be listening to this recording later, thank you for um, making an effort to um, attend afterwards. So the reason that we're all interested in this topic is that we're all aware that there are serious implications of climate change for natural resources and therefore for how we manage natural resources. Um, if you're thinking about coral reefs, you're probably fairly familiar with many of the direct and indirect effects of climate change. If you happen to work on other systems, you can probably insert your own stressors here. Um, it's all about direct effects of climate that might be in the case of coral reefs due to thermal stress causing bleaching. Um, morbidity and mortality or direct damage from increased storms. Uh, you can have similar effects with other systems. There's a lot of interactive effects where climate change's effects on precipitation um, might be changing runoff patterns and amounts, uh, might be having effects on sedimentation along with sea level rise, and having all kinds of effects on their follow on effects on disease. Um, Ocean currents are, are being altered to some extent, which can affect connectivity between aquatic systems. And then we have this specter, this more recent specter of ocean acidification, um, which uh, is due to uh, the related factor to warming CO2 and changes in ocean chemistry. So we came together on this project asking, how can we respond to these changes by doing more than simply saying we need to manage 
the stress that we're already managing and just do it better or more, but differently because climate change has effects on the way the stressors are behaving and climate change can have effects on the way our management practices even work. What does it look like to try to become more climate smart with what we do? I want to just quickly show our Cracker Jack Corals and Climate Adaptation Planning team. Um, you'll see Britt Parker's name. Also, David Gibbs here is um, an EPA fellow who, uh, along with Britt and myself, will be the three main mentors for the team. But we had um, really great technical teams in Tech Tech, as well as participation from Department of the Interior, um, uh, EPA, uh, some private consulting, and of course, um, the Nature Conservancy. But really, this team was part of an even larger team. As, as Sherry mentioned, um, this is a collaborative effort of the Climate Change Working Group of the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force. Um, this is an interagency group tasked to lead U.S. efforts to preserve and protect coral reef systems um, through coordination with 12 federal agenc agencies, seven U.S. states, territories, commonwealths, and three through the associated states. So we had a really large network of um, partnerships and participants that we could use to, to test, to first conceive this whole um, effort and then test it. Our starting point was this Climate Smart Guide to Conservation, which came out in 2014, and some of us on the team were involved in producing this document. It's kind of a, a soup to nuts um, explanation or examination of the latest that experts in adaptation have to say about uh, how to integrate climate change considerations throughout management planning for natural resource conservation. As such, it covered all types of systems, used a, ver a variety of examples um, to develop higher level principles and practices. Um, so as such, it was still a fairly high level document. And we realized that there's a need to tailor and test the applicability of these principles in real world situations with specific systems in specific places. Um, so our goal with our effort through the Coral Reef Task Force was we felt that Coral Reef is the perfect system to tailor and test climate smart adaptation plan, planning principles. In this case for coral reef management, um, making sure that we're building on uh, advances that have been very rapidly occurring on the ground, especially in the areas of vulnerability and resilience assessment methods for coral reefs. So marrying the on the ground thinking with these higher level principles. Um, the overview of, of the initial sort of uh, translation that we did has been published in environmental management and is basically the overview topic of lesson one of the course. Um, let me mention here that all of the documents that I'm showing you are accessible through links within the course module, so you can access these um, at any time if you want to. So briefly, the Climate Smart Approach is based on thinking about a generalized planning cycle. This isn't meant to invent, invent some kind of new cycle. Anyone who's thinking about uh, developing a management plan probably has some variation on these seven steps that they have to carry out. The Climate Smart process is really about putting a climate lens on every step of planning to think about where climate considerations are relevant. Um, now, given in the case of coral reefs, uh, the coral reef community's very sophisticated knowledge and methods for vulnerability and resilience assessment. Um, there's a lot of information on how to do vulnerability and resilience assessment, a lot of information out there, uh, which is not to say we can't always improve on those methods, but we felt that the, the real place we wanted to really push forward was here in step four. How do you take sort of general ideas in a climate smart guide or even um, in the literature for your system Take those general ideas, um, brainstorm options that would work for your place, and think about making them climate smart. And the central piece of this is this idea of taking general strategies from the literature um, that might list a variety of options, but then this process, process of applying a rigorous climate smart design piece. Um, and the purpose of that is to make uh, your description of your action more climate smart so that you can have a, a more robust way of comparing your actions and thinking about their effectiveness so that you can evaluate and select your final list of priority actions in a more climate smart way. Um, I want to note that the tool can be used at multiple levels. 
um, while we originally conceived it here for step four to brainstorm many options and, and look at their climate smart design, we have found with our partners that it, it is also being used um, quite a lot in step six. In other words, once priority actions have been selected down to a small number, folks are returning to the tool and um, with subject matter experts for particular projects and don't, and going to a more detailed level of planning or of climate smart design. And that basically is generating your technical um, results for your implementation plan. So we'll be focusing on step four. We will be focusing on coral reefs because um, climate smart design is really about getting very specific about the design of an action for a particular system for a particular place. Um, but as I'll touch upon later, it's quite transferable to other systems. And while the examples and the homework we will be providing focuses on coral reefs, we do invite you to go ahead and do it uh, if you want to, put in your own actions for your own system and let us know how that goes. So here's just a, a picture of the flow chart of this tool. I'm not going to go through it because the overview of the tool is basically the content of lesson two, which you're going to proceed to. Um, two points I want to make is that when we call this a tool, this is not a tool in the sense of what, what we sometimes call tools. It's not a quantitative model. It's not a data analysis um, methodology. Uh, what it is is basically just a structured thought process that breaks down a really complex problem into a series of smaller steps that you can get your head around gradually and uh, with other people in a systematic way. So in that process, lots of insights emerge, um, which I'll mention later. And so in a sense, the process itself of working through these questions and working through these, um, these steps is just as important as the end point. The end point is to come up with a list of actions that are written in a climate smart language um, for more robust evaluation. But along the way, lots of things are revealed um, that people are finding very useful. So as I said, lesson two will give a very general overview of the tool. So um, you will then delve really deeply into each of the two activities. And you will get to try them out using real world examples. So that will be lessons three and four. This uh, guide that you see, Parker et al., this is the user guide, which you also will have links to in the lesson. Everything that you're going to be seeing um, and learning is covered in this user guide and in many cases in more detail. So this user guide is a, is a great reference for you to use throughout the course. So why use the adaptation design tool? Well, what does it do? What it does is, in the first activity, it helps you apply climate smart design to your management activity. So it walks you through a process to take a specific action or a specific project and think about all the aspects that would need to be adjusted to render it as robust as possible, given the effects of climate change, both on the threat that you're managing and on just the way you can even implement your activity. The second activity it does is it supports brainstorming of additional adaptation activities that may be critically needed. What I mean by that is you may uh, already have a management plan, um, but in light of examining the most recent scientific information on vulnerability and resilience, you might recognize that there are some aspects and some threats that you currently are not addressing your plan. And so we have a compendium of information from the literature that can be used to brainstorm specific actions that you might want to add to your plan. And I would point out that if you happen to be someone who doesn't currently have a plan, who doesn't already have management actions, you can just start with this activity to, to start building your list of actions, the brainstorming step. You then, once you have actions, you then run them through that climate smart design process. So you can start at any point in the tool. And as I mentioned, along the way, the process generates insights, especially on information gaps and research needs. It may reveal where there's important information about vulnerability that needs to um, be uh, looked for or perhaps might need new research. Um, so information gaps uh, about the biology, about the climate effects, about the vulnerabilities. 
Um, and you also get insights on what starts to come up is when you think in more detail about your actions, you begin to think how your action might interact with other actions in your plan. In other words, what are some of the synergies or trade-offs or conflicts um, but that you might have between the action you're thinking about and another action? Are there any sequencing considerations where you would really need two actions to go together in order to get the um, outcome that you want and they might need to be sequenced or they might need to be done together? What does the tool not do? Well, it doesn't do a vulnerability assessment for you. One of the important information resources that you do need to have in order to use the tool is vulnerability and resilience assessment information. That's step two of the cycle. And while, while generating a vulnerability assessment is outside the scope of this tool, we do provide some information in the guide um, about where you can go uh, to, do, to um, figure out how to do basic summary vulnerability assessment and where you can get some resources. So you might, it doesn't generate the vulnerability assessment, but you'll find when you're using the tool that it does tell you what form and content of information on vulnerability you need to use the tool. And that can send you back to step two in a way to go get that information. It also doesn't make uh, your evaluation and selection decisions. This tool does not make your decision for you, um, but it does support a more robust decision process by giving you a large list of um, options that are described in a climate smart way that can help you understand the potential each action might have to be effective or not be effective given the effects of climate change and the potential for them to interact with each other. And we hope that this will allow this evaluation and selection step to be better informed. And it doesn't produce your implementation plan, but it certainly does, especially if you go into do a deeper cut, as we call it, of um, using the tool on the actions that you've selected, it does generate the technical basis for your implementation plan. There's some other value, to, value added in using the tool. Um, this, these things have been emerging as we have tested the tool and, and worked with collaborators who are now using the tool. It structures and clarifies a, this complex thought process, which I've mentioned. And in so doing, it provides transparency and a record of the thought process that a group of people have systematically gone through. And therefore, it, folks feel that it can add credibility to the decisions that they make, or it can provide justification to higher level decision makers, where they present a very uh, well thought out and um, transparent record of why they are pushing for a certain decision. It helps you proceed through this thought process, um, looking at and, and acknowledging uncertainty without being paralyzed by it. Um, it encourages you to just move through the process and uh, the, the uncertainty is one of the problems that might be noted. Um, it can be taken into account and it's always possible to go back through and improve information as more information comes, becomes available. Um, it also supports consideration of spatial and temporal scales in planning, and it provides a practical basis for higher level strategic planning. So what we've been finding with some other partners is that as um, they run a whole series of actions through the tool, um, the information that's emerging about the potential for actions to remain effective uh, given climate change effects, in other words, their ability to be made climate smart, um, that begins to shed light on whether that needs to have an effect on higher level strategic uh, climate smart planning. So who has been using the tool? Um, our colleagues in West Maui and the Reef to Ridge Initiative um, have been really instrumental um, from the beginning of this project in helping to conceive and host our very first workshop where we um, really tested the waters of interest for climate smart planning. And that's where we first conceived this tool. And they were also instrumental in uh, hosting and participating in an expert consultation for the first beta testing of the tool. Um, in Guanica Bay, Puerto Rico, we also did expert consultations and we're currently continuing work with them in a collaboration because they're in the process of re revising their watershed management plan for Guanica Bay uh, watershed. and uh, so we're helping them use the tool on, on more actions. The Florida Reef Resilience Program, we recently ran a tool training and workshop with them and they're finding it useful and are hoping to continue using it in their climate smart um, strategy revisions. 
Um, in American Samoa, there is a variety of uh, work that's planned on climate change adaptation planning, and we're just starting a collaboration with them to support that. And finally, the Chesapeake Bay program, um, which has a series of goal implementation teams, has been using the tool um, for this higher level strategic planning that I just described, where they are they have run a series of very specific actions on uh, wetlands, uh, climate smart management questions, as well as for seagrasses and for management of toxic contaminants. And by going through the types of projects they view as meeting their current strategy and evaluating their climate smart potential, they're, hoping, they're using that to inform revisions to their higher level strategy. That's, and, and we've worked directly with them on their workshops to use the tool for these other um, systems. And it's been quite transferable. So I, I now want to take a moment um, to introduce two of our um, really important folks who have, from the very beginning of the project, been instrumental. Um, Eric Conklin was uh, one of the first people to get involved in this project and came to our original kickoff for the project. He helped to review the compendium of ideas from the literature that you'll be relying on in this course. Um, he attended the first workshop and he attended to the expert consultation. Um, Toba Callender is our West Maui Reef to Ridge person who as a practitioner um, was super important in helping us really try to continue reality checking um, what actual activities, in this case, this um, multiple watershed planning exercise that she's involved in uh, can benefit from the tool and helping with the um, beta testing. So I wanna give Eric uh, as our continuity guy a moment to reflect a little bit on his experiences with the project and the tool. Eric. Uh, thank you, Jordan. Um, uh, and thanks for the invitation to, to share my experiences with the group. Um, you know, my the, the program that I'm a part of with the Nature Conservancy here in Hawaii, uh, has we do a lot of planning. We do a lot of planning with state partners and community partners uh, in collaboration with our federal partners. and through all of these different planning opportunities you know we know climate change is important and we know it's something that we need to factor into our planning activities but frankly we've really struggled over the years to to incorporate that in a meaningful way uh and you know for a variety of different issues um the the time scales for the projected impacts of climate change haven't really closely aligned with the time scales for the planning activities and then even when you don't have that issue, there's the question of like, how do we actually do it? How do we bring climate change into these other planning processes? And we just really struggled with it. We knew it was important, but we just couldn't figure out the, the, the right way to bring it in and, and have, you know, develop these climate smart uh, adaptation uh, processes. And, and, you know, when when I first got invited to participate with the the CCAP work, I just I found it really exciting. Uh, it's a lot of the things that Jordan has said. I found very much to be the case. Um, it's it's the structured process that it provides is a great way to to help think through that the, like how to bring that climate change piece in, how to make it real, how to make it tangible how to make it not this huge daunting task that I couldn't possibly think about how to <laughs> incorporate, but how to break that down and be like, oh, okay, I, I see this. I see how I can bring this in. I can take this step. I can ask these, these straightforward questions that the tool pr prompts you with to say, hmm, let me evaluate the, the threats that I'm considering, or let me uh, evaluate the, the the likely long-term success of these strategies that we're talking about in light of changes that we expect through, uh, through climate change. And those prompts and examples and that compendium of, of information that they've pulled together I've just found to be incredibly helpful to, uh, to, to be able to think through uh, how to bring those, that climate change piece in in a very real way. Uh, our program tends to use conservation action planning or the open standards for con conservation. One of the things that had me initially a little hesitant about this is, oh boy, another planning process. Uh, even if it's valuable, there's only so much time and energy and community uh, partner uh, 
sort of willingness to engage in, in another process. And one of the things that I love about this is how flexible it is and how easy it is to adapt and incorporate into existing planning processes. Like, like I said, we use the conservation action planning or open standards, and, and it's actually very straightforward and intuitive how you can incorporate these climate smart principles and the questions and prompts and compendium information, how you can incorporate that into the existing conservation action planning process and come out the other end with a, a much improved and climate smart uh, uh, plan. So, um, so I'm really excited about it. We're just now um, in the process of starting to integrate these design principles into the new conservation action plans that we do and reviews of existing conservation action plans. But uh, I, I think it's a fantastic tool. I think it's got a ton of potential. Again, I love how flexible it is. And, and I think it's a great opportunity for you guys to, to, to learn more about it and see how it fits for you. I, I would fully expect that your experience will, will be like, like ours has been and find it a very uh, straightforward, valuable, structured way of making something that seems almost impossible tangible and meaningful and achievable. And that's all I got to say. Thanks, Eric. Tova, and um, especially from the more specific perspective of the Reach to Ridge initiative, um, what are your observations? Well, there's going to be a lot of echoing of things that have been said uh, because it is really a, a very helpful tool in translating complexity to something you can manage. So my role was to be a part of that first workshop in July of 2014. A lot of stakeholders were brought together. It was super to be included in this process of refining the tool, not only because it, it's really valuable, but also we used West Maui as the example to explore. So I had the opportunity to work with other great minds to kind of <laughs> think through the things that we were working on. Um, and then in the second consultation, we were working more, that was in 2016, working more on uh, specifically step four that Jordan highlighted and um, looking at how the stressors were changed by climate change and then looking at our management actions that we were already starting to work on in our existing plannings and looking at the interactions and timings. So um, we did... Uh, get to much deeper thinking. Sometimes it's not what is immediately apparent when you're going through a process of, of digging in more deeply into the stressors separate from the mitigation action and then looking at the, the relationship between the two, you get farther along. Prior to being involved in this process, we'd sort of done climate planning light, sort of a one day <laughs> version of, of thinking just through what are the stressors that are impacting. Uh, but this was a, a whole other level uh, that we could get to. One of the tools that was really helpful, and I don't know if this is available for all the regions, but I recommend it to the regions, is we got a cheat sheet for West Maui, for Hawaii, of where we think climate change is uh, going to take us and what we need to be considering, and that was super helpful. Not to say there weren't moments of frustration in muddling through these workshop exercises. Uh, on that first one, it was quite it was quite challenging, and I think a lot of changes were made to how to look at the process and streamline it for later on. Um, but it was a great experience to be in the workshops and have the support of the facilitators and the note takers so we could just really focus in on, on what we were trying to do. So um, the topic of uncertainty came up earlier in Jordan's comments. And, and, and that, of course, is still there. We found when we're digging in a little deeper, in some cases, we don't know if an area is going to get wetter or drier. But at least knowing that there is a risk factor in either direction helps with the planning of those longer term projects so that you can be factoring that thinking in uh, and, and hedge your bets the best you can. In looking at our practices, we realized that the climate process isn't necessarily relevant for every single thing you're going to do. Some of the measures that we're looking at have a much shorter timeline uh, than when we're likely to see climate impacts. And so we don't have to necessarily use it for, for everything, but it is very uh, helpful for especially those longer term projects that require more investment and a, and a, and a longer planning horizon going along with them. 
So sometimes it's going to be those local political or financial factors that are influencing your decision making. Uh, but if you don't include this climate piece for those large scale long term projects, it can be quite disastrous. So we are uh, in an iterative process of cycling between planning and implementing and we'll have another round of picking out our priority actions for mitigation going forward coming up in the next year or so. And I'm really looking forward to circling back with this tool then as a part of one of the screens we're using to translate the complexity that's inherent in this sort of work um, to, to making better decisions. Fantastic, thank you, Tova. And um, I was smiling when you talked about the first workshop because we, we really did almost break our brain in the first workshop and we, we did do a, a big course correction and really in real time, that's when the tool was born. And I think you're talking about iterative processes of, of planning is really important. This tool is a very iterative tool as well. Um, we're still breaking our brains on, on this. It, these are hard questions. This is your hard um, thought process to get through. And the tool's flexibility, as Eric mentioned, is intended to help um, just iteratively keep thinking over and over through it and improving as you go along. So all very much in alignment with what you guys said. Um, before we open it up to general questions, two, two things. I want to make sure I answer that question from the participant about coral reefs versus other systems. Um, again, in order to actually try the tool, you need a specific system. And so our examples will focus on corals. Um, however, uh, if you have familiarity with the vulnerabilities of your system, there's no reason why you can't run your own actions for your own system through the tool. And we're still working on this tool. So in a sense, you participants are now part of our team um, as we struggle to continue to grapple with these thought processes. We're, we'll be really looking forward to hearing how it goes with both different coral reef uh, places where folks are, are trying out the ideas um, or with different systems. And please, please do let us know how that goes and how well this translates to your system if you're trying to think about it for another system. And then finally, I just want to give um, the other two mentors for the course a chance to say a quick hello so that you know what they sound like and who they are. Um, the first is uh, David Gibbs, who is an ORISE fellow in EPA's Office of Research and Development. Um, David, why don't you say hello and, and any comments you'd like to make? Off of mute. Okay, we don't seem to have David at the moment. But Can you hear me? Ah, yes, now I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I'm David Gibbs. I'm a research fellow at the EPA, and I am thrilled that all of you are going to take this course. Um, I've been testing the adaptation design tool out with some partners in Puerto Rico, um, and it's worked pretty well so far, but, um, we, you know, we always want more experience with it. So if you, like what Jordan said, if you guys use the adaptation design tool for any of your own projects, you know, in ways that we talked about or ways that we did not anticipate, we would love to hear about it. I look forward to working with you on the course and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Thanks, David. And my esteemed colleague and co-lead of the CCAP project is Britt Parker of NOAA. Britt? Hi, guys. Um, I just reflect uh, or um, what David said, that we're really looking forward to working with all of you. And um, this has been uh, a long labor of love, and, and we're really thrilled to launch the course today and have all the resources out there working with our partners at the Nature Conservancy. Um, it's, been, it's been a great experience, and so we're really excited um, to have you all on board. And I look forward to um, speaking with you um, over the next month or so via the forum and through the webinars. Um, and good luck and have fun with it. <laughs> Thanks, Britt. So Sherry, I think we're ready to handle questions. Yes, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, so go ahead and type any questions that you have for our speakers into the question box. Or if you'd like to ask your question of them, you can raise your hand and um, I can unmute you. So one of the questions that we have, 
probably for Jordan. Do I have to already have a management plan or management actions in order to use the tool? No, you do not. Um, the two activities of the tool, um, can, you can start with either activity one or activity two. Um, we start by talking about an existing action as an example, um, because uh, a lot of folks who are using the tool do already have a plan. However, the second activity of the tool is to brainstorm the actions that you want to put into your plan. So if, if you don't ha already have a plan and you're just building one, you would just begin with activity two of the tool. And then once you have some actions that you've selected through that brainstorming exercise of activity two of the tool, then you would plan the smart design them. So in this course, we'll be you know, starting with some actions, but it could go the other way in, in practice if you were building a plan from the ground. Great. Um, OK, another question. This is for Eric. Could Eric say more about how it integrates well with open standards? Eric, you might have to unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, uh, sh sure. I mean, it, it's just, um, let's see. It, you can essentially uh, uh, treat it in a very modular way and essentially take the module from the climate smart adaptation and apply that to the relevant part of the open standards process. So when you're evaluating threats, there's a series of prompts and questions that CCAP has developed that you can just apply into the evaluation of those threats. So like questions like, you know, this is your threat now, but how do you expect it to change? And examples of the kinds of changes you might expect to see. And I have found that very useful to say, hmm, okay, here's my current threat. But but by looking at those prompts, I'm evaluating that threat and the trajectory of that threat a bit differently. And then similarly, when you move on to the strategies, it's okay, like we tend to focus on the sort of short term and like the open standards process for evaluating threats. You know, you've got that generally sort of five year time horizon for evaluating the, the efficacy of a strategy, but the prompts, questions, examples within CCAP, I think really help refine that and, and help you think about that longer term climate change adaptation piece and can highlight examples of strategies that might work great today, but are gonna start failing a few years down the road as, as the threats and changes from climate change start um, coming down the pike. So that, like to, to me, those are the sort of core things is, is just a, a series of, of questions, prompts, examples um, that, that you can essentially just bring into the, the, the open standards uh, discussions of threats and strategies and really help make those much more robust and climate smart. Great, thanks. Um, someone asked, uh, will we receive certificates for this training? And I mentioned them a bit when I was talking about going through the lessons. Yes, there's actually a self-downloadable um, certificate that you can get after you go through the lessons and take the survey at the end. So you'll see that on the training page. Um, another question, Jordan, do we need a specific case study to work on for this course? So it's kind of related to the management plan, but it's a little different. Um, well, it, you, you will be provided with examples um, when you take the lesson. So if, if you have, don't have your own case study, um, both when going through the lesson, you'll be given examples, and then our little homework exercises where you get to try it out for yourself, you will also be provided with um, both vulnerability information and specific actions that you can use. So in this case, it'll be for Guanica, Puerto Rico, and you're ju you would just pretend that you're them. Um, however, as I said, if for folks that do have their own, you, you can use your own instead. And you really do need to have a particular place and particular actions because that's really where the rubber hits the road um, and where the theory becomes practice. So, um, like I said, the specific examples um, that you can use will be provided. Okay, another question, um, I think for Jordan also, do the ideas that come up with the CCAP tool 
include socioeconomic considerations, management options, and considerations, or is it exclusive to biophysical? So um, that's a really, really great question because it allows me to mention that, you know, as I said, when I said that lots of insights emerge, um, there are the notes columns in the worksheets where we encourage um, we encourage you to write down the things that come up that are not purely the ecology piece, not purely the biophysical piece. Um, because while we're focusing on, you know, what is the technical climate smart potential for manipulating the system in this way or for, you know, dealing with a stressor, that's the focus of the tool. When you do get to that evaluation and selection step, that is where all the other important criteria that go into decision making come in. And that is where you have really other really important criteria like cost, socioeconomic needs or considerations or interactions or pressures, um, the urgency or political expediency or opportunity or, you know, there's a million really important criteria. And so that those things do naturally begin to come up and we record that in these notes columns and that goes into that um, information and uh, gaps and in information needs often from that column comes not only what do we need to do research to understand vulnerability better but often it also includes hey there's this really important socioeconomic consideration let's write down this reference this paper we're going to need to come back to this when we do evaluation selection it's an, it's an important link um, how do different actions link to uh, actions for those who are working on socioeconomic issues, et cetera. And we've had um, some people, I've had uh, at least two or three times now, social scientists come up to me at conferences really interested in using the tool um, for social sciences and for socioecological planning. And we haven't gotten that far yet, but I'd be really interested um, to get feedback from folks on how it could be extended or used in parallel and uh, how those linkages, you know, can can better be made as you go through the, you know, the biophysical consideration. So thanks for raising that. Thanks, Jordan. Okay, if you have any other questions, go ahead and type them into the question box. Um, somebody asked if I can't take all the webinars, can I still take the course? Of Yes, you can. Um, we know we don't have a great a time zone that works for everyone since we have people from all over the world. So if you have a colleague who might want to take these or you're going to be in the field and you can't make all of them, we're hoping that you can still join um, by taking the course, the lessons and doing the assignments and then um, using the recordings as needed. Well, um, so we're coming to the end of our hour here and we've thrown a lot at you the, for this uh, orientation webinar, but basically I'll be sending out um, some of the instructions that I went over by email. And again, you can um, email me if you have additional questions and you can also post questions on our network forum as well. So I wanna thank all our presenters today and thank you participants for joining us and uh, hope you have a great day. Thank you, everyone.